Uh, I'm uh, I'm super excited to have uh, not two but three people uh, join us to to speak today. Um, if you're new to Product Loop, uh, then let me just share a little bit about uh, about the purpose. Um, so it's uh, what I'm trying to create here is a community for uh, not junior product people, but actually the more experienced product people, where we don't spend that much time on the fundamentals and how to do a design system or how to do a prioritization or planning or whatever. But, you know, once you've read the books and uh, once you have tried it out and once you've been through, you know, two or three agile transformations or, you know, after that went through a discovery transformation, I think that was the big thing a few years back. And you figured it out that, uh, you know, that didn't work either. That wasn't the holy grail. Then what do you do, right? When you don't, uh, when you can't follow this dogmatic approach to to doing great products, um, you know, prescribed to us by the gurus, maybe just to sell books. Then, like, who do you lean on if you don't lean on them? Right? Then you, I think, you need to lean on some something else. You need to lean on best practices and and talk to people uh, and hear from people who have been in the shoes that you are in right now and learn what they did. Right? So the the uh, the starting point is that the fundamentals are in place. Uh, we have uh, probably abandoned a few of the high uh, of, of the dogmatic approaches, but we still have high standards of, of how, what we want to do things. But we're ready to to try new things out. Um, I actually like this uh, this slide. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it. If you've been through an agile transformation or two, you might have seen it. Uh, it's like a uh, way of learning uh, from from. Uh, Japanese martial arts, but it's also used by lean people. So it's called Shuhari. So the idea is that there are three different stages uh, to learning. First, you know, it's kind of like if you've seen Karate Kid, there's the wax on, wax off thing, right? You don't really question why you're doing things, right? You just do a stand up and just do that prioritization. You just do that refinement and the, the retrospective. You don't ask questions because these things have proven to work times and times again. So you're probably better off just doing it. Right, uh, it's better than doing nothing. Those things have proven to have some some fundamental value, right? Just like uh, just like you know, uh, pilots in an airplane, right? They have checklists. They do stuff that they don't necessarily uh, have decided themselves because this these are good things. This will prevent bad things from happening. So that's kind of the shoe phase. In the next phase, uh, you start to understand the rules and probably also recognize. Uh, Thomas, can you can you turn off the audio? Thanks. You start to, to question the rules, to question what you're doing. Uh, you know, trying to to bend the rules a bit, or at least uh, use different tools to achieve the purpose that was set out. And so, so you detach from from the dogmatic approach and and start trying alternative tools, alternative methods, and so forth. And then the final phase, the rephase, is where you actually start questioning um, the rules of the game. Like, why was this important? Why did we need to be product-led? Why did we need to have that North Star do that OKR thing, right? What, what was the intention? And does that really fit with our environment? And I think uh, the topic today is actually, uh, you know, trying to bend those rules. Um, and, and I'm actually quite excited by the lineup. Um, I started uh, talking to Thomas, uh, who uh, I know from uh, from the uh, the push conference where I've I've had the pleasure to uh, to speak a, a few times, um, and uh, Thomas, you were uh, you started out as a product discovery coach just as as I did uh, I think back in 2017 and 18, uh, and so you know we can share slides and, uh, and 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 methods and so forth, um, and it's been interesting to follow kind of your. Uh, uh, growing up as that, as it, which has been quite similar to, to the reflections I, that I've had. And just, I think in the, in the end of, of last year, I, I, I saw a post by, by Thomas where you said something like, you know, PMs, product managers, they can do mockups as well. And that's okay. Right. And this is, uh, you know, just coming from an old designer to an PM, that's an interesting perspective. Um, and I was really intrigued by this and, and have been wanting to kind of do like a pragmatic uh, product people manifest for some time. So, you know, I, I thought this, this could really be interesting. 
Um, so uh, so we talked a bit back and forth, and I thought, hey, let's why don't we just you know do a meetup like this? This would be super interesting. Um, and uh, you said that you've always dreamt about doing a book about the topic. So uh, let's see uh, where that goes. Maybe this is the start. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, I'm looking for co-author, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, if I, uh, maybe we should talk then. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. The thing is, I I cannot. I'm very lousy at doing things alone, but I'm yeah. I'm I'm pretty cool. I'm pretty good in like teamwork, like doing things together. Um, cool, cool. So yeah, if so anybody uh, want to write that book with uh, just with, with that with Thomas, <laughs> then uh, then reach out. I'm just gonna have a little plug uh, actually uh, for why I'm doing this as well because um, this is actually also the reason why I I started this endeavor that I'm I'm on right now. This journey that I'm on. I started this. A mentor platform for product people for product uh, ux and leadership so if you don't lean on on the book or the dogmatic approach then who do you lean on and i think actually then you would need to lean on people who have been there before so learning loop that io that's a uh, a platform where you can uh, book one-on-one uh, -on -one calls with uh, quite experienced product people uh, who have this mindset that, that i'm describing now so they've all been pre-screened for that um and uh, yeah, so if, if you want, if you are at that level, if, if you want to, to talk to people who've been there, who survived, who made it out, uh, then go visit learningloop.io. Um, you have to apply to get in, uh, both for the sake of, of me uh, wanting to actually know that I can provide value to you, uh, but also for the sake of the mentors. They are volunteer uh, mentors, so, so it's, it's quite important that they're working uh, and spending their time with people uh, which is worthwhile for them as well. So, you know, it's the top 5%, but if you think you're worth it, then you give it a shot and, and, and create an account and, and apply. Um, all right, so today's topic, talked a bit about it, is product team collaboration. So um, uh, by product team, I, I, it's, I probably refer to what Teresa Torre is called uh, the product trio. Uh, so that is uh, a design lead, a tech lead, and, and a product manager. So that is in the viability, feasibility, and, and desirability, uh, and, and those uh, working together. So that can come in many shapes and, and sizes. Something Sometimes it's not a trio, it's a quad, and, and sometimes it, it goes back and forth. But how do you uh, manage you know, those people making decisions um, about the backlog and where are we going about strategy? How do we collaborate uh, the best? Um, the today's menu is Thomas uh, first, Thomas Glazer, who I already talked about, and I love the title. Uh, I own this. Get over your ego. So I think that will uh, that will spark a bit of uh, of uh, interesting thoughts. Uh, we actually had uh, another guy uh, who uh, on on the program uh, as well, but uh, last minute he had to cancel. Uh, so uh, so Thomas stepped in as the networker that he is and said, "Hey, I've got two awesome people." Uh, who can do uh, just as good, if not even better. And this actually fits quite well uh, with what I'm talking about. So what we did is, uh, is that Thomas is doing his original talk, which is uh, 25 minutes. And then uh, Jan and Nico are, uh, are going to do um, uh, like 10 minute uh, lightning uh, talks. Uh, in, uh, and they had since yesterday uh, to, to uh, prepare. I know that you are ba basing it on, on uh, previous presentations, which just are awesome by itself. So I'm, I'm sure it's going to be good. But to be honest, Thomas, I'm not sure I'm the best uh, to actually present Jan and Nico. So can you just uh, take it, take that over for me? Yes, help me uh, can do, can do. Um, uh, and yeah, good. Uh, I think I'm good to go. Thank you for the introduction, Anders. Uh, also see familiar faces. Thomas, I see you. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm ready to go. I will take over. Um, let me see if everything works perfectly here. Da -da -da. You should see a black screen, which is completely normal and fine. And let's go. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, the title of my talk is "I Own This: Get Over Your Ego." And yes, uh, this image is generated by AI. Um, you can see it looking at the foot of the little boy on the left, which is slightly awkward. But anyways, I think it fit quite well. Um, and uh, yeah, like Anders said, the initial idea for this talk was basically triggered by uh, 
this little nice meme, um, which I found a couple of months ago on LinkedIn. And uh, first I found it um, quite funny, but it also like make me think. Um, quick question here in this round. Um, what, what do you what do you think and feel when you when you look at this meme? Any reactions from your side? You want reactions only in the chat, or can we can we speak up? Uh, speak up. Yeah, it sounds it sounds very. It looks and, and feels and sounds very real. <laughs> and, and what I would add is the inner thoughts that the PM is having inside his head. I think these awesome. I think they will love it, and I think they should do it exactly as I imagined. So, on, on which side are you? I'm a product strategist. So I'm, a, I'm more on the PM side, so I do more products, architecture and strategy and alignment. I do financials and product portfolio management. But uh -huh. still, I, I empathize a lot with uh, designers and developers because I've been there. Have, have, have you been on the side of the guy with the tongue out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, it's it's part of who I am. I'm just aware of it now. Try to keep it. <laughs> well, good. Anyone else who wants to uh, share thoughts? So, you know, I would say that happens when there's confusion and a lack of leadership. If the PM is not leading in providing guidance as to where we're heading, roadblocks, understanding what leadership wants, understanding what your customer wants. If you don't provide that leadership, everyone is confused. Mm -hmm. Jacob? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of on that page too. I'm thinking, why, why are people too busy? Again, if we go with the idea of the trio, why does the trio not have a shared focus? Why are the design representatives in the team too busy to mock up what's on top of the PM's mind? Um, it, it feels like a, a missed opportunity to align on that and then spend the energy on sharing that focus, sharing what you think is important as opposed to spending your time uh, do, doing your own mockups. Having said that, I do like the technique of putting together something super basic just to help share that context and say, this is not what we should be doing, but allow me to illustrate what I'm talking about so that you can go away and do much more with it. Also, we can do much more with it together. Mm -hmm. I, I think what 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 i've seen um especially from designers and actually also design leaders is that um they've been a little bit annoyed when uh, when other people kind of do their job i mean like a notion of like why do stakeholders why don't they respect our uh our our like craft right it's, it's me who are the designer right uh and you know uh just tell me the problems and and i'll i'll figure out what the solution is uh what the solution is right that's that's kind of my turf mm -hmm. um and kind of being annoyed by that i i've experienced mm -hmm. that uh, several times actually mm -hmm. um, you know uh under the, the pm has to help the designer sell the sell your <clears throat> sell your um uh vision mm -hmm. You know, so it, because you know you have you have to sell it so that you know executives are not really creative. There's just bottom line. But if you can sell the vision, how it will translate into dollars? I think mm -hmm. they'll buy it. Yeah, but you know, still, you know, then if you sell the vision, then you know there are some designers who say, yeah, uh, good, great, uh, I'll create a design based on that vision. Please don't do that. That's that's my job, right? Don't don't do my job. Yeah, I think uh, um, I, I would say let's let's uh, uh, pause the discussion here for now. Uh, I will go through and, and, and continue a little bit on my thoughts about this. Uh, but I think we already got like very different perspectives on it, which is great. Um, so uh, let me continue a little bit, and uh, we, we will come to some uh, points later. And hopefully, we have uh, some time for discussion. Uh, note to myself, and maybe also to others. I think it would be also a fun format if you just pull up uh product management uh, memes uh and just discuss it i think that would be also like a fun uh format for a meetup yeah, that's awesome uh, yeah <laughs> that's it next um the whole thing got like 
5,000 likes, went viral on LinkedIn. Uh, a lot of people found it like super funny. Like I said, again, uh, I found it funny too, but then it made me a little bit think like, wait a second, who actually owns the design? So for me, this image represented something like ownership, right? So uh, PM is doing a mock-up, which obviously in this meme, he's not supposed to do. And the kids are like, what the hell are you doing here? Um, so you're basically crossing a line here that's like our territory. Please go back to your territory thing. Um, so there's probably something with like ownership. Um, going back to a very simple question, well, actually, what is design? Um, I liked the one from, from Oxford Languages. Uh, it's a defined plan of the look, the functioning, and the working of an like digital object, let's so to say, or digital product before this even made and uh in order to get to this plan uh i i really follow a core belief um which is uh which was also coined by uh joseph boys not sure if you know it um super famous um german artist uh who had basically the fundamental belief that every human being is an artist so everyone can do something can uh, has the freedom to create, can transform, can reshape things. Um, so it's not like bound to people who studied art uh, and it's not something for them uh, to, to hold this. So everyone is invited at the table. And uh, for me, that's also basically about diversity. And um, if you look into research, uh, there's quite some controversial research topics about diversity and creativity. Uh, but what they found out is like groups, most members have diverse knowledge categories, like coming from different backgrounds, so to say, uh, can produce more original ideas, like something very, um, yeah, creative and new, like not just doing what the others did. So something also innovative, I would say. Um, the problem is, uh, in order to join the party, you have to be able to design. Um, that's some some like fixed thinking I've came across. Um, yeah, for the last years working in several setups, enterprise uh, consulting, small startup, uh, whatever you want. So there will be always some people who kind of like have this um, fixed thinking of you need to have study design or have some like expert knowledge in order to actually do it otherwise you are not allowed to, to to join which i think it's um not very good for your creative confidence uh, and it is and that's what basically triggered me with this meme is uh that i'm that i'm also like a product and ux coach for 10 years uh already so i'm training people uh, people who come to my workshops are product managers, uh, developers, marketing managers, uh, designers, and you have no idea how broken those people are, and I need to fix them as soon as it's about sketching, like sketch out the first idea, and people say, like, oh, I cannot sketch because, you know, back, back in school, my art teacher said, uh, I'm, a, I'm a lousy artist, like I, I cannot draw. And then like other kids came in and said like, haha, your drawing looks shitty. Um, and then you're basically uh, blocked, right? So um, I would say at its core, creative confidence, and there's actually a book about it, um, is about believing in your ability to create change in the world around you. So the, the core belief that I can do it, I, I have enough knowledge, I have the right skills to uh, participate. Um, and actually, it turns out that creativity isn't some rare gift to be enjoyed by some lucky few. Uh, it's a natural part of human thinking and behavior. And like I said, the main problem is it's blocked or it gets blocked quite soon, um, which this um, statistic um, shows as well. So there's a, I call it, um, it's called a creativity to experience gap, which means 
the younger you are, the less experience you have, the more creative you can get, the more unique your ideas uh, are. The older you get, the more experiences you gain, um, the level of creativity and like also like unique ideas you can produce is actually going down. Um, this has like several reasons uh, and for sure, uh, that's a perfect uh, graph for people immediately shouting, ah, oh, it's, it's school education fault, uh, schools are uh, wrong and you know, till the age of 15 schools killed all the creativity. No, it's not just the schools. Um, it's also like our society, um, um, uh, also like the limited perspectives itself, like uh, as an adult, you have more fixed views and beliefs over time you collect because you see how things work or you believe this is how it works. Um, and this makes it very hard for you to find new and different angles. Um, and it's also a lack of practice. Kids just have, when we were all young, we actually had lots of time to draw, uh, paint, uh, sing, dance. Um, we did this like, I mean, I just look at my kids, they're doing this all the time. And I myself, I don't know, I cannot remember when was the last time I sat down for an hour drawing. So, um, and, and last but not least, I would say also the fear of making failure. Um, adults are way more hesitant to take risks and try new things also because of like, yeah, bad experiences you made. And that's actually the problem. So when our self-worth isn't on the line, we are far more willing to be courageous and risk sharing. Um, so one way to embrace creativity is to let go of comparison. Don't compare yourself with others. Um, it's easy to say, very hard to practice. Um, so, and actually in order to break free, you have to create a space, you have to create the uh, uh, a context and environment for you um, where you can actually let go. And um, everyone who attended a brainstorming session, so we'll probably come across those rules like defer judgment, encourage wild ideas, but this is exactly it. So this is about um, basically every creative session, if you think about it, um, wants to make us children again. So let us let let us go wild. Everything's possible. No judging parents. You know, um, just go to your uh, playground and and go wild. So that's basically, I would say, the core idea of every like creative session. Um, and I more or less posted like the ideas I had and which what what this kind of like LinkedIn post triggered. So. Um, basically, I don't see the product manager actually doing a mistake here. Uh, a, pro a PM is, from my point of view, absolutely welcome to come around with a mock-up. Why not? Um, it's a cool conversation starter. It's actually better than trying to get this idea you have in your mind out and put it somewhere so everyone can see it and we can discuss it. I think it's way harder to like pull those ideas out of your brain somehow by asking and trying to, do you mean this with it? Or do you mean this is like, what do you actually want? Like, can you please describe it? And if a mock-up is the way uh, a PM or even a tech lead, like if developers are fine with drawing something, although majority of them is broken, I would say, from like the people I know and I experienced with. Many developers are very reluctant or shy to actually draw something. Um, but if they can, if you en encourage them, it's actually cool for the process. Still, um, I got replies on my comment, like, uh, everyone can join and have a voice. Why? Like, then just ditch your design team. Like, why do you need a design team then if like everyone can do mockups then? So, haha. -ha. Again, we're talking about territorial thinking um, or like another one who came across said like, um, I did like 
studied master degree, uh, hours of studies I poured into, taking dozens of courses. Um, this is why I am more qualified than a product manager to, to make design decisions. Uh, fair point. Still, again, my personal core belief, following Joseph Beuys, everyone is an artist. Everyone is able to basically put something out and uh, uh, yeah, have, have a first starting point for discussion. So I would say the main question is here, or like two main questions, who communicates ideas to reach common ground? Uh, and I believe visual visualization itself, like I said, can help to transport the idea, like getting your thoughts out of your brain into uh, on, on kind of like some piece of paper or onto some micro board or whatever. Um, the mindset should be like, uh, this is it. This is how it looks and works rather than uh, like talking about something in the air. I also like um, the motto from IDO, never go to meeting without a prototype. And the prototype for me is also just like a napkin sketch, just something you sketched out very roughly. It's already something you actually can take apart and you can continue um, discussing and, and base a decision on that. And the second question is basically, who is actually responsible for the design part? Um, I would say the design domain itself as the experts to craft a design concept uh, is with, without any question, right? So that's why you have a design expert at some point. Um, and, and, and every stakeholder who thinks, hey, I can quickly do uh, a design work which works on my own, probably uh, has or shows a little bit of disrespect for the expertise. So there is some expertise needed to come up with a really nice, final, bulletproof, validated concept. Um, to make something very simple in the end, um, it's not that easy. And that's why you actually have designers in the end. So I would say we, we, we don't have to mix up design phases. Um, we should not mix the diverge part where you create choices and the one where you actually converge, where you make the choices. Um, and there we actually have um, exactly contradictory uh, insights from research, which means diverse groups have actually difficulties identifying and converging around their most creative ideas. To sum it up, if you're in a phase of diverging, you need lots of input. You need to create choices, involve as many people as possible, PMs, business people, product marketing people, uh, customer service people, analysts, designers, tech people, data scientists, and they all should join bring their perspective in, in best case, also draw. And if you think you already go a little bit further and draw your first mock-up for the sake of, I need to get this out, do it. Um, and then there's the part converge, where you make the choice. And that's probably the part where, for example, for first discovery phase, the PM and the designer gather together and say, okay, how can we set up the first experiment for this? Um, so for closing in, keep it to the experts. Uh, which means, okay, cool, designers are here to make the choices, which means, yes, we should be more design-driven, um, which triggers something again. Uh, if I hear this, and I, I would say almost every team I joined in the last years, there was always someone rather ranting for, we should be more, our organization should be more product-driven or our organization should be more design driven. Um, I believe actually there's no driver, um, like no single driver. If you have only one single driver, probably this will happen. Um, and again, I truly believe in like proper team collaboration. Still, um, I believe there is some kind of like issue here and there with, um, uh, sometimes PMs, but also like designers having this idea of like, 
I'm actually the only one who's doing the hard work here. Like I'm the expert and no one else does realize actually how hard am I working, which is a, a, a wrong perception, so to say. There's uh, also studies where they interviewed workers, um, how much they think they are motivated versus how much they think their colleagues are motivated to do work. And it turns out 70% of all the workers and employees interviewed think they themselves are motivated, while uh, the majority of the colleagues are not, which is just a paradox. It cannot happen, right? So it cannot be possible <laughs> that the majority thinks we are super motivated, while the other rest of the people is probably not. Yeah. So that's a wrong perception in itself. And I think it, it's, it's based on a psychological um, effect called uh, the drama triangle. So in the drama triangle, you basically have three uh, personalities. You have uh, the victim role, which I was talking about here, right? So I'm the, pure, uh, the poor designer. Um, I should actually be in the driver's seat. I should run this, um, but uh, there are like some bad people, like so-called persecutors, um, which doesn't let me do it. Uh, and I'm hoping for some rescuer to, to help me. The interesting fact is actually in this drama triangle is you, in any case of conflict, you are in all the roles present. So if you think you are the victim, if you look closer, you have also acted as a persecutor at some point. So you kind of like were also pushing other people or you didn't do anything in order to basically become the victim then. Um, and also the rescuer is uh, some, some role. You probably, if you like look back at the, at the last conflict you have been into, you probably at some point acted also as a rescuer. So you also try to help, try to make the whole thing better. Um, and, and I think that's a, a very good model to keep in mind next time you kind of like slip into one of those uh, uh, roles in a conflict in a drama. How can you escape the drama? Um, for example, if you feel like you are the victim, try to get to, into the creator role um, from oh there's a problem and there's only problems you have to basically transfer your thinking into okay wait a second how can we try to actually solve it um if you're into like the rescuer approach the rescuer actually has it seems to be the nice one here in this setup but the problem with the rescuer is that um the rescuer gets a lot of energy from helping people. So other people depend on this person. The more they depend on them, the powerful, the more powerful the rescuer get. And dependencies in product development, usually something you try to avoid. So the idea is basically to get from a rescuer to a coach. Like, how can I help people to gain their own responsibility? That's actually the, the best end state here. And last but not least, the persecutor to challenger. <clears throat> so the ones where you think they blame you, or they like push you too hard. Think about in every even worse situation, there's also some positive effect on it. So think of a persecutor more like a challenger. So they don't want something bad for you. You actually want to uh, push you to the limit, like to really question, is this really the best you can get? Um, so you're not the victim. So the, the, the others where you think uh, they do harm to you. Think of them like they actually want to challenge me. They want to, to they push me to another limit. Every time something feels hard or too hard is actually a moment where you grow. So think about the others, the bad guys, as people who actually make you a better person. Um, and then, like Anders introduced it, uh, looking back uh, into like this classic product trio setup, product design tech. Um, there can be like gaps between those roles and those gaps come with costs like um, 
there's a gap between the design and product manager uh, talking, collaborating. Um, there might be a gap in co coordination and collaboration between tech and design and also between product and tech. And all those gaps um, come with costs. It's coordination overhead to always clarify, like, what is the designer role to do? What is the product person to do? This kind of, like I said, territories, right? So everyone builds their own territory. And this is my design space with a clear outline. And this is your product space with a clear outline. I do this and you do that and we don't intersect, right? So um, again, those those unchecked gaps um, create coordination overhead and those overheads also can make it into the product. So um, if your coordination feels a little bit like not fluent, don't expect your product to be fluent. Kind of like Conway's law, right? So the product is a mirror of your organization. Um, so high-performing product teams, and shout-outs to Anthony Murphy here. Um, there's a whole article about it on Medium. Um, I like this image where actually design, product, and tech are not just a Venn diagram you see quite often, but it's really like a fluent overlaying circles. Of course, everyone has their own like speciality, but uh, in best case, you have the right people with the right skills who become like very fluent and coming back to this like, ah, oh, it has to be more design driven or tech driven or product driven. That's one of my favorite quotes from Cameron Mall. We are not design led, not development led, also not product led. We are design informed, right? So you get the information from your ex. Um, you also get feasibility information about uh, the development and also the product manager informs you like about business, go to market strategies, the roadmap planning and so on. So in the end, we should be all led by a vision. We should be led by customers, customer requests, customer uh, jobs, customer pains, and overall the real understanding the real purpose, the real problem we are actually trying to solve. And if we understand that, then we can go to work. And uh, yeah, kind of like closing this with three methodologies. Um, to define actually how do we want to work, um, because this is more important than actually what we are working on. Uh, and I would like to start with uh, this, like, I'm not sure if you're a basketball fan. I am, since I'm a small boy. I'm, I was actually always tall, so uh, I, I, I played basketball um, when I, in my teenage years, and uh, I was very happy to see that the German basketball team made it like third rank in the European Championship, which was no one was thinking about it. and. One of the reasons for their success is, um, and this is also what I heard in team interviews again and again and again, they said, when our coach, Gordon Herbert, um, he's actually uh, um, has a sport psychologist uh, background, that he said he, he treats us players in the way how we need it. Like all the things um, he communicates uh, very transparently. And the very, the first thing he did when he joined as a new coach, was define clear, transparent roles and nail down who of you is responsible for what. Uh, what is your strength? What is your weakness? And according to your strength and weakness, we will find a spot for you. And everyone else in the team knows your strengths and weaknesses. And, and if we don't settle this, um, we, we cannot continue. So that he made this like very fundamentally. And I, um, have a um, Miro template on the Myroverse, which is exactly about this. It's called Roles and Responsibilities. Um, it's a it's a card game you can play with your team to do exactly this. So it's a like thirty six cards uh, game with different kinds of responsibilities. And on the other hand, you have your roles, and then you play this with your team. Like who is doing what? And there's no blueprint for it. That's why for every team this will be a unique uh, image, what you get out of it. But then you actually clarified it. The second one are so-called uh, Belbin roles and, and also like the Belbin toolbox. So this helps you to assess the strength and weaknesses of your team. So uh, are you more like a specialist? Are you more like a, a complete finisher type? Are you more like a team worker or more like a networker? And then you can place um, 
kind of like up to three characteristics of each team member. And you can also shape a map of this collective strength and weaknesses of your team. And then there's a like a nice toolbox on the right where you can see, for example, here in this like fictional team, we have almost no one with team worker uh, capabilities or no one with like really good implementer capabilities. And if you, for example, don't have an implementer in your team, then, for example, you can try to fill the gap with methodologies and and um, frameworks like roadmaps, project plans can help your team to overcome this kind of like weakness. And last but not least, also like the approach uh, with the so-called team alignment map. Gather as a team, very simple four-step process, agree on joint objectives, agree on joint commitments, like who will do what, what are what are our joint resources and also what are the joint risks we as a team can run into um so i think that's it and uh if you uh if you look back basically coming from the product manager uh with the hey i did the mock-up i think again perfectly fine as long as you and your team agree who's responsible for what, talk about it, if you see there any, there's any issue. Um, and in the end, again, don't get defocused by, the, I'm, I wish this whole thing would be more design driven or so, and why is no one like caring about designers in my org, or why is no one uh, caring about product managers in my org? Um, gather people, think about your team, uh, objectives, commitments, and uh, no matter what, you will find uh, a common uh, ground. And this leaves me in the end with, if we have time for a quick debate, what do you think who actually owns the product? Thank you. Go ahead, Adam. Uh, thank you, Thomas. I mean, I really like the, the use of the memes <laughs> in your presentation. Uh, I think it's it's making it uh, like a very lively presentation. Um, I mean, now now maybe my ego is kicking in. I'm I'm coming more <laughs> from uh, from the designer perspective. I think I mean I can clearly see the perspective of um, of the product manager uh, wanting to sketch stuff or wanting to you know bring ideas or you know spending some time here and there mocking something up. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But I think the meme, you know, the meme itself, and especially if you look at the expression, the face expression of the product manager, uh, he's not here just to throw in the idea, right? He's here to present the idea as this is what we are going to do and just go and, you know, push the pixels so that it's it's going to be perfect, but this is what we are doing. And I think that's the that's the point of um, of some of the some of the potential conflict that can happen in, in the teams, right? It's not a... It's not a question about whether we should co-create or not. It's more about uh, coming from this perspective of, of I am the product manager, and by by that you know the manager kind of designs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. Exactly. Yeah, I just um, want to bring it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just to just to um, kind of prove that. So it's a. I, I think that's that's probably um, the perspective that I have had uh, a couple of times in in my career. And um, and I think you know maybe maybe that's something that you can also take into account in your presentations going forward. I'm not saying that your points are not valid. I think there's plenty of stuff uh, which is which is very relevant. Um, mm. But I guess you know I was missing maybe the the other part. You've been saying stuff like poor designer, oh poor designer. You know, like it's it's mm. partly it's also that I've seen also designers who uh, who just go around and complain and you know and and just play this victim part. That's yes. that's fair enough, but I also see some uh, some stuff happening on the you know on the other side also, which uh, which which I think could be uh, could be interesting. The other meme that you have used, the one with the uh, with the designer uh, working and everybody around looking at mean, that. Uh, no, this one. Uh, this no, one? no, no. Yes, this one. I think this reminds me very much of this design by committee situation where everybody's just standing uh, around and saying no let's do let's do this oh let's do that 
and the poor designer is working and everybody's just you know uh observing that so i, th I think that's probably the perspective that i see when i when i see that picture um and that's maybe you know this design by committee is also something which uh, which could be could be relevant in the discussion but anyway i just wanted to throw those those couple of points um yeah Adam, I just want to uh, reply on that, but because I think from from what I've seen, I, I, I know people who have the feeling inside a company it works like this, uh, but they don't take into consideration that this is an image of a designer who has no idea what a strategist and the account director and the copywriter is doing uh, in the meantime, so it feels for them they're just standing around doing nothing and I'm doing the whole work, which mm. I don't believe is true. Um, I'm pretty sure that if you ask, again, it's about the study, 70% of employees think they are very hardworking and motivated. I'm pretty sure that the strategist, uh, if you ask him what the strategist is doing and like how he's contributing or he or she, um, uh will give you a full list of things they're doing and or how they are also contributing to the solution right again i think this is a mm, wrong pers like not wrong but like a mm, critical perspective from one person in the team which might not be true that's the thing yeah i mean what, what i'm trying also to say is because yeah. co-creation works uh many ways right so i, mm. I could also ask you a question why why couldn't the designer be become also involved in the work that the strategist and and other people um you know that that has been done before right because in this way the designer would feel more involved the designer would also feel uh, more informed uh, about what's happening they could also um kind of have a say in, in in doing that so so i think um yeah again i'm i'm coming from you know from the perspective of designer so of course i'm uh, I'm kind of uh, I'm I'm seeing it from from this side. Um, yeah, I just wanted to throw out those couple of comments in. Thank you, Thomas, for a good presentation. Thanks, Adam. So so uh, I have a question as well, but just want to just ask you a question in relation to what uh, Adam is saying. So so I think you know I think it's an interesting question in terms of what will happen if you uh, if you have if you think that the intention of the other people saying that like. Uh, I just create this mock-up. If you think the intention is to start collaborating rather than directing, what will happen then? And my guess is that then you would actually to start to be part of that strategist's job as well, because you will go then on the other turf as well. Because if you start the collaboration, you would need and, and engage in that dialogue. You would need to understand the other part and you would be let in. So if you let other people into your world and let them decide some of your turf, hey, then you'll have a say back. Is that something you can uh, you, you agree on, Thomas? Yes. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, um, I just realized from what, what Adam was saying, um, what I didn't see in this picture before is actually that it's like an adult talking to kids, right? And uh, again, from a psychological point of view, this is like a actually very unhealthy relationship. If you if you um, switch into um, parent to children communication inside of your team, Nico is mm. nodding his head. You study psychology, uh, <laughs> which is true. Uh, um yeah that was just the part i was thinking about that probably the triggering part is potentially that right if they're all yeah. just friends and one is showing the picture that's a different story all of a sudden again, it's a detail um, but i guess uh, now we're going actually that it's a detail <laughs> but i realize it now that actually in this team setup the two children are the designers it looks like they are not equally to the product manager right uh that's what probably also some like confusion uh, or what triggers some people like I'm the designer as seen as a kid in my team I have not the right um, word to say and probably sometimes it feeds for designers like that yeah. um, but I don't want to take time from like Jan and Nico um, I, I think we no, have some I think I think I think it's okay I think it's okay it's an interesting discussion I think we can spend five more minutes on it actually so okay. Jacob you just uh, you, you want to go ahead 
Yeah, just thought of something here because it um, it relates to a thought I had when you shared that uh, that meme of of there not being a driver, and I I agree, and it's it's part of the empowered nature that the PM, the designer, and enge the engineer are all all equals, and I I like how you went away from the Venn diagram and had the circles overlapping a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, I also think there's a point here in what you said about being vision-led, customer-led, and purpose-led. And I always, I, I often find as as a product manager that what I'm bringing to the table in in the trio and in in the wider product development team with with more engineers and more folks working alongside those three trio members, what I bring to the table is articulating that business vision, that purpose, that product strategy that needs to be aligned across teams. If there's more than one product team with more than one trio, it's so vital that initiatives are aligned across those teams with a shared strategy, with a shared purpose. So it's not for each team to reinvent that. It's more for each team to realize, to discover together, how do we, with each of our three crafts, contribute to that unity of what the entire organization is doing so someone has to take the lead on that being shared i find that falls on me as the pm and the question then becomes how do i do that in a way that's empowering in a way that inspires everyone around me in a way that motivates them and doesn't feel like i come and tell them what to do a prototype coming in with a prototype I can see that being dangerous and people feeling I'm stepping on their toes, which is not the intention. I can also see it working well in just visualizing some thinking and making the intention clear that, hey, this is just for me to visualize what I'm talking about. That Now let's figure out how to make it better, how to not do this at all, but do something else. It's just a way for me to express my thinking. But I think, as you say, that very much come down, comes down to the team and how each team um, prefers to work. And that's why it's so important you build, you spend the time building that relationship, building those relationships and understanding the people you work with. I agree. I think you and really touched. Thank, uh, you for, uh, thank you for a great presentation and inspiring a lot of thoughts. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, I would like to add that perfectly fine. But uh, uh, on the other hand, you are opening basically the Pandora box, right? So like involving uh, uh, everyone with the vision shared, everyone knows what to do, da, da, da. That's actually also one of the main jobs, I would say, right? Uh, and this, if you're working for a big um, organization, for example, like I do for, for uh, OnlyFi, we're having like five big product clusters with product directors each plus PMs and UX people underneath and a ton of developers. This is like one of the main things you are doing day in, day out, right? Involving everyone at some point, more or less, uh, kind of like maintaining this overall view. And to be honest, uh, you cannot get everyone on board. So there will be always someone who doesn't agree Things that should be different. Um, yes, um, that's actually yeah. the the hard working part. I know, but they they may agree uh, or not. But at least I think it's important to communicate what they are to communicate what is happening, what has been agreed, so that people know what they are agreeing or or disagreeing to, and exactly. then mediate the conflicts as much as possible. And it also has to do with. Um, again like how how big is your ego or like is your ego easily to be um triggered um because for example i had it lately that uh, a designer just was swamped with work but uh, the product manager needed to get stuff going and asked me like do you know any other designers who can quickly chip in we didn't have anyone so the pm actually did wireframes um and ag agreed with the designer and the designer said like fine i have no time so you can do it um uh, the pm was more or less um i would say had solid ux skills right um was mocking something up on on in powerpoint and then 
uh, showing this to the designer. So the designer was basically the coach, the sparring partner for the PM's wireframe. Mm -hmm. And then the the wireframe in the end made it to, to the development. Works if both, you know, agree. If you also, uh, I would also say what you said, Jacob, how you frame it, right? It's more like, hey, can I help you? Mm -hmm. I want to support you. We need to get this thing going. Yeah, sure, go ahead. I will spar you. That's something different than like, Haha, ha, look, I just made a mock up. Uh, do it. All right. I think a uh, very good discussion. We could probably uh, follow up with another meetup on, uh, on that with just uh, more Thomas talks. But I think uh, we have some interesting things to follow. Um, yes. So, so uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, can we just all give Thomas uh, some uh, virtual high fives here? And so I think I think it was a very good job. Uh, I'm going to watch it again. And uh, if you want to watch it again, you can go into Learning Loop and uh, in the video library, you can you can find it there. So let me see. thanks a lot. So thank you so much. So before Thomas that you introduce Nico, I just want to say that uh, if you want sparring on this topic, just a little plug here, then you can of course uh, book these mentors. Um, and Adam, who actually asked that question, is also a mentor on uh, on, on product loop, right? So, uh, so there are plenty of, of people to uh, to uh, to give you more insights if you want to get in this. I've talked to each one of these uh, about this topic, and I know they're passionate about it. Uh, and Adam, you pro if you're ready as well, then um, then uh, say just yes, and then uh, people know that they can book you as well. All right, so. Uh, Thomas, you wanna you wanna introduce uh, Jan? Yes, uh, uh, I, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jan. Um, I know Jan from uh, Sing, and uh, what I really like about Jan is um, he's kind of like a, similar to me, check of all trades, right? It's uh, someone you probably all have worked with. Those type of people, you cannot really put a stamp on it and say like, ah, this is like a UX designer. Uh, I think he's like half UX, half product, uh, also like solid technical background. Um, and those people are actually very rare to find. Um, so he's also like very good in, in um, understanding product strategy, business strategy a, a bit, and also thinking about how can, uh, how can we actually not build things right, but build the right things. So, um, we actually had a discussion on this talk about uh, product discovery trainings. And I was also a little bit frustrated as a discovery uh, coach and also doing workshops that sometimes had the feeling, yeah, sure, I'm making money. Um, like, well, selling product discovery workshops two days um, is something which works. But does this really help? Uh, and I think Jan has uh, also some experience from his side to share, and I'm um, happy giving it over to Jan. What, an, what an introduction. What an introduction. Thank you very much, Thomas. <laughs> this is amazing. So let me share my screen. Yes, please. The whole monitor, this one. So here we go. So um, I want to start. Currently, you see a black screen, um, and I want to give it a quick ten-minute lightning talk. And I was really intrigued by what Anders said that Product Loop is for the experienced practitioners and the leaders in product, because I think I have something for you in the next ten minutes. Um, because this whole notion, what Anders said, what do you do when your teams, when they have read the books? when they have done the trainings, but it's not really picking up. Um, so I think I have something for you. And in this uh, next uh, 10 minutes, I wanna work on, I wanna introduce you to uh, why product discovery trainings are only effective to a limited extent, or how I call it, why product discovery trainings suck. Um, let me share a little lesson, a little story from my own failure. Um, I'm working in the field for over 15 years in digital products. I have developed my craftsmanship over multiple companies, multiple projects. And uh, as I grew to senior, really mastering my craft, um, 
I wanted to scale that to the wider organization. And what I did, I did, I gave trainings, I gave presentations, I gave workshops, all the stuff that Thomas just said. Um, I was trying to educate people around me. But honestly, nothing really changed to a certain degree on the scale, how the operation, how the organization is like embracing product discovery, really figuring out what works, what does not work. So I needed to shift a little bit. I thought like, this is not working. I'm standing on stage and I'm preaching as I do right now here um, with you, but um, I needed to do something else. I needed to shift from telling to doing. So I had it to stop preaching. Um, so, and to go there, let's look at first at these workshops, these trainings, these pro discovery trainings I'm focusing on. Um, they are amazing. I've been in them, I've given them, um, and um, I'm asking, I was really hard asking myself, what is this problem? What's the problem with these product discovery trainings? Why do they not have the impact for the org entire organization as we intend to have, or as we plan, as we envision these trainings will uh, scale? So I have brought you three problems. Um, my favorite three problems, there are many, many more, why product discovery trainings are not so effective, why they suck, basically. Um, but I have brought to you my three top uh, reasons and my three top problems. So let's dive right in. First one, these trainings are not the real cases. They are artificial. In these product discovery trainings, you train on cases that are set up to be easy. They are set up to be obvious. What's the next step? They are not hard because people in these trainings, they learn things the first time. So you set up very easy, very intuitive kind of cases. The next thing is, it's not really risk. It's all artificial. In product discovery in the real world, it's risky, it's complex, it's, it's hard, it's hard decision making. And in these trainings, it's all artificial. It's all set up, not really a risk. There's not real money on the table. And the third is, it's also an artificial situation with the people involved. How often are you going to trainings and you learn five new people never seen before because everybody is coming together, really wants you to learn something. But in real life, your team is another one. Um, totally different people. These are not in the trainings when you go there. Um, and sometimes you have long term settled teams with high trust, totally different situation to do product discovery in. Sometimes you have newly formed teams more on the storming than performing phase and whatnot. And uh, sometimes you have highly skilled people and beginners in the same team. And all these situations you're not really set up for um, in, in trainings, in these project discovery trainings. So this is the first reason what I have an issue with these trainings. Second is, it's not about the framework, I call it. Um, I guess a lot of people of you know these all these frameworks, tools, methods, just name a bunch of them, lean, the build, measure, learn cycle of lean, um, design thinking, the double diamond, the jobs to be done, journey mapping, all these canvases we know from value proposition canvas to team canvases and whatnot. So in real life, teams really need to flex their muscles to really use these frameworks uh, perfectly and to get the most out of it. And I wanna look at uh, these frameworks from a perspective of how do we learn things? How do we learn these frameworks? And Anders showed us this Shuha remodel with this Shuha reface. I have brought you another one uh, going to the same model, uh, same trying to have the same uh, outcome or the same intention. It's the growth stages of understanding. And I have that from a talk by Jared Spool. Uh, the talk is called Beyond the UX Tipping Point. It's a very good talk, highly recommended. It's on YouTube, uh, watch it. If you have nothing to do this evening, go right there and watch that talk. This talk is telling how do we learn? And as a human, we start in the so-called unconscious incompetence phase. And that's the phase where we have no clue what we're talking about. Uh, everybody kind of starts there. Kids, when they are discovering things, they have no clue, or if we, we reach into a new field of technology or in a new field of product, we have no idea. That's the unconscious incompetence phase. 
after that, we have the conscious incompetence phase. There, that's kind of, we know that we're not good at something, right? Then the next stage is when we learn things, we come into a conscious competence phase. This phase is where we know what it's about, but we still need our rules and our kind of guidance of really doing it because the last phase is the unconscious competence phase and there we are mastery. This is kind of the phase where a piano musician is just playing, not looking at the keys, really mastering his craft. And stage from stage to stage to master or to get from an understanding from one stage to the other, there are kind of things happening. The first one, coming from the first to the second phase, we call it literacy. You literally go, you learn something and trainings are amazing for this. When you have no clue, attend a training, you learn about it, you get literate in something. To reach the third phase, you we, we, we call it fluency, getting gaining fluency. You kind of know why you do it, you have done it, you have done it multiple times and then you come to a phase where you use these frameworks, these frameworks as checklists and stuff like that, really following over and over again. And last but not least, reaching the last stage, we call it, we gaining mastery and gaining mastery. This is when you have done it over and over again, applied it in multiple kind of situations. And I call this when you're gaining, uh, what you do then, you call the, yourself a craft, craftsman. So this is the, it's not about the frameworks uh, and in trainings, they have the place especially in the becoming from the first stage to the second stage of understanding. Third issue with trainings, um, the goddamn daily grind. How often do I hear teams when I'm talking to them, when I'm working with them? Yeah, I could, but mm, I have to do X and Y and yeah, right? All these things, it's, it's less about the process. It's more about the habits you have to form. Um, it's really the thing that you have to, to do it over and over again. And the habits of the daily grind, I have done it over and over like this, the wrong way maybe, or not the perfect, uh, not the optimal way, uh, but you always rely back to what you're used to and what you're good at. So there is a model for that. How can you change your habit? And this is by uh, Nir Eyal. You maybe know that book. It's the hook loop. And it's uh, to quickly run through, it starts always with a trigger. And the trigger is the situation and the place that dictates what we will do next. And we remember this trigger over and over again. Second part is the action phase in the loop. The action phase is the simplest behavior in anticipation of the reward. Let me remember, uh, re repeat, it's the simplest behavior we often do when we get that trigger in terms of getting a reward. And behavior, the key element of behavior is motivation and ability. So the motivation in product discovery trainings is totally different than reality. You go to a training to learn something. It's not in the real world where you do this action and then get the reward. And the reward phase is tied to the thing we create. So it needs a certain ration of enforcement that we get this reward. And a habit is forming when we build over and over and over again, the same reward that it builds up an investment, a bank of always getting, gaining that reward that we like it. And the same trigger happens again and we go through the loop. So it is the, how this is a good model when you think about it to overcome this goddamn daily grind. So I have shown you three reasons. Let me give you a solution. My approach is my, 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 yeah, guess is or my um, appeal to all the leaders in this room and to all the experience out there. Uh, what can you do when you have read the books and your teams have read the books? You could do a little bit more coaching, facilitation and consulting. A big chunk of coaching, a small, a little bit less of facilitation and a little bit consulting. And I want to show you how I fix these problems. So with coaching, you work in the complex situations of your products and your teams, the real people. You deal with them um, with a product trio, as we heard uh, uh, the talk before. You work in the in the team, in the real situation, with the full complexity. And this is very, very important to form these habits. Second part, how we get about this framework thing is when teams are 
we are starting they are yeah struggling with these methods they struggle with which template oh shit this template i haven't used it for a long time but when you are an experienced leader you have done it you have mastered it help the teams become fluent by contributing your mastery because you can pull out whatever method is necessary at the right time and last but not least to get over this goddamn daily grind uh, with coaching, you can nudge behavior, you can form new habits, you can help the teams that are working with you, that are working under you, working next to you, uh, really form new habits and change this daily grind that it becomes a better one, a more intentional one. So how to get started? You might ask, sounds all reasonable, sounds all good. Um, there are, I want to give you three simple things that you can start on tomorrow. First, think a little bit of the, about the conditions. They are fairly easy. Second is a little bit of environment. And last but not least, practice, because with practice, we get better. So conditions. An easy condition that you can set up to get started in coaching is work with another team. Work with a team where you have no stakes in. No stakes in the work. It's just a team over there, a different business unit, whatever. A team maybe that is happy that you're helping them. Walk with them and do not walk in front of them because you should not make their decisions. You don't have stakes in that. That's making it much easier for you to get into this coaching habit. Second tip I want to give you is a little setup of your environment. Set up regular check-ins with this team. Um, you would feel you you would be surprised how much influence and how much coaching you can do with just let's say two times thirty minutes a week or even two times 15 minutes. You can do many, many things with your craftsmanship, with your experience uh, for these teams who are struggling. Um, and second, have some basic rules. I wanna give you my two rules I have in my coachings. One is my coaching sessions are not stand-ups. It's not a status report what happened in the past. What I do in these 30 minutes, I'm talking about what's happening in the next three days. Where are you going? What's on your mind? And the second rule I have is the team is in control, not I am. That means I don't make any decision. The team makes the decisions. I'm nudging them to make now a call or let it go. Or I involve, I, I, tell, tell those, I tell to the team, you involve me as much as you want, or you kick me out whenever you want, because I want to help. I don't want to be forcing myself up on the team. And last but not least, it's the easiest one. Gain some coaching and facilitation skills, and you get that by practice. You have just to do it. Work with the first team that is super helpful. And one tip is giving advice is easy. Coaching is the art of asking good questions. You want to read something about it? I give you a book recommendation afterwards, but think about it. When you really want to do coaching, stop not giving advice, do this, do that, and ask smart good question that triggers in the team what to do next and by that my last call to all the leaders and all the product experience people out here stop preaching and start coaching thank you awesome thank you so much Jan. uh i think this was uh this was the reason i started learning loop the mentor platform right um, I think this is uh, this is just super. I, I couldn't agree more. Thomas, you have uh, you have raised your hand. You have, do you have a question? Uh, no, just a, just a remark or add on to what Jan was saying. Um, asking the right questions um, it triggered some experience for myself. That, uh, for example, as a as a director, um, PMs come to you and actually ask you questions like, "Oh, what do you think? What should I do?" Uh, and one of my favorite things to do is actually to flip it back to them and say, like, what do you think uh, <laughs> we should do? Right. So they come with a question. The funny thing is, they always have an answer. <laughs> so you come confused. It's like, oh, shit, I don't know. Uh, please, boss, um, tell me what to do or help me. And it's like, hmm, I'm not sure. What would you suggest to do? Um, so without me saying anything, they basically come up with the own solution. And in 95% of the cases, what they said was the thing we were actually doing. 
I'm not sure yeah. if there's uh, there's probably a, a word yeah, for what it, I also methodology, like. <laughs> but yeah, like... yeah. What what I, for example, what are one of my favorite questions when a team comes to me, Jan, what should we do? Is um I'm 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 pivoting towards what's the problem why you do not know what to do. Really digging deep into where is your confusion, not knowing where what's next. Because we all have a hunch what we should do next. It's just we need reinforcement that, yeah, that's the right next move sometimes. Um, sometimes it is maybe not the best idea what they have in mind as the next move, but surprisingly often they have a good hunch what's coming next. And also on product discovery, um, Nico, you know that better than me maybe even as we are working with multiple teams and multiple companies and um, there's not only one way how we do product discovery it's a ton of things it's a messy thing but uh yeah getting our craftsmanship out and knowing having done a lot of stuff um helps a lot great thank you so much um so so i get from your talk that you want if you want to continue learning as an experienced professional do some coaching, right? But but what other things can you do? Uh, what if you don't have another team? What if you're just like one single product team? Or you know, what yeah. do you do then? So maybe this is, if you're uh, just one single product team and uh, you have issue, you have a problem in your product discovery, maybe I would think of getting a coach. I mean, you have the perfect platform, Anders, <laughs> for that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Was that the plug? No, no, really, seriously. Um, as a coach, sometimes you're not into the game. You do not have stakes on this on on the line. This is giving you a totally different perspective. Asking good questions, and the answer is most of the time in the team already. They they make the calls. Yeah. They just need some nudges here, left and right. So if you're I a team what... only, not having any possibility where you can coach then maybe uh, you have the situation that you need a coach or if you're a product leader with multiple teams by not telling them what to do as Thomas said maybe kick in a little bit and practice how can I coach my teams yeah I think what Thomas actually had a pretty good point because what Thomas did by asking that question back was actually providing confidence and clarity and saying yes, yes it is okay I mean just say it out loud I know that you're diverging from the path from what was said in the book and preached by the book, right? But it's okay. Just take, this is one step further uh, Nirvana, right? We're not gonna get uh, to Nirvana in one day. We're, we're doing it in multiple small steps. To so just have somebody to lean on and say, hey, yes, I think that's a good idea. Just go ahead and do it. But having been there myself, this, this, and this might happen. So just you know, take that into account, but it's ultimately is your decision. And I think that's actually the biggest value from, from mentoring is that you just get somebody to lean on and say, yes, it's okay, right? It's a compromise. Yes. I'm, I'm being pragmatic and it's okay. Because if, we, if we're not pragmatic in this world, then we're not, we're not gonna get by, right? It, it, we're, we're just gonna be stuck in an analysis paralysis, not being afraid not to make the ideal uh, choice as prescribed by the book, right? I was in a in a, in a, in a like master class from a uh, one of those big uh, authors at one point, and you know I was describing uh, the environment I was working in, uh, which had product owners and then somebody else deciding as well. You know, just the classic enterprise setup, and the response was, you know, that seems like a toxic environment. I would get a new job right now, but the fact is just you know. Then almost everybody. I was in that environment. Job. Exactly. Right. <laughs> then we all have to get a new. I, I have met so many teams. I've coached so many teams. Uh, I've, uh, right. I, I've, everybody hates how they're doing it right now. Everybody's fed up with not doing product right. Nobody is doing it right. So just be pragmatic and take into account that every place is different. And what might work for somebody in the book might not work for you. Right. Just adapt it. Right. And, and you know, just having that confidence to lean on something else, I think that's that's the hard part. Yeah. So I could go on forever because, of course, this is what I I'm yeah, fired up that, about. This is this is my new. Can living, we please right? rant more about book authors? Um, yeah. As much as I, <laughs> no, to, to be honest, as much as I uh, loved Marty Kagan's book when it came out, um, I also believe that, uh, yeah, it can it can lead to some like misconceptions or like again what i said um comparison right so you always compare yourself with empower teams from rt and and yeah. you will fail 
because what he describes is like like a perfect picture. Uh, he imagines how things gonna work, um, and this feels makes you feel miserable. But the truth is, or at least I can tell from being everywhere. I owned my own studio. I was at big, um, large enterprises. I was at like small startups with like three people um, and like mid-sized companies in between. There was never ever a team which was happy with the way how they're working. And even if I went to companies, they were super successful and I found out, okay, now I'm joining a super successful company. I expect a more or less happy team. They were all like, our product discovery is a big piece of shit. And I was like, <laughs> okay, guys. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. So, so uh, Jen, I heard that you were at a uh, product discovery training today. Is that right? I was in Nikos training. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, which was the coaching? Yes. Maybe, yeah, maybe Actually, uh, do a this quick talk, uh, intro. I was nodding so hard that my neck started hurting when Jan was talking. <laughs> so, so I, think I, I love it. It's the perfect layup. It's the perfect. We didn't cut so like, We didn't that's plan this. <laughs> that's a great that's segue. Perfect segue to introduce uh, Nico. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm. I'm very happy to introduce Nico. Actually, Nico and, and I uh, work together. Um, unfortunately, he, he he left the company to pursue his own dreams, which I think he's doing quite properly good um, so far. Um, and uh, yeah, I I, I have uh, in the rare cases seen again like someone who uh, understands like kind of like all the perspectives, right? So um, I think Nico, correct me if I'm wrong. I was not 100% sure, but your background is in psychology. Yeah, it's psychology and computer science. Yeah, exactly. So psychology and computer science, very interesting uh, combination. Um, and uh, yeah, then actually advancing from a front end developer to a, a product manager, um, but also had a very good understanding of UX, I would say, for a like non design studied uh, person. Um, so uh yeah I, I i actually i was really a pity that 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 she left but again um i see that uh uh the whole product coaching and um product discovery consulting you're doing now uh, seems to be paying off and doing well um so i'm really curious about what you will bring to the table now um about getting started with collaborative product discovery yeah, cool. Same Thanks, way. everyone. For those that are sticking around, uh, really cool. Um, I mean, this is interesting also because this is like me and Thomas catching up after quite a while. Um, so uh, I can do this, I think, and then I should be able to. Um, OK, can you quickly say if you can hear me and see the screen? Yeah, perfect, perfect. Wonderful. Uh, great. So uh, I do have like a found like an old school timer here. Uh, that can start now. So if that beeps, my time is up. So you will know that I'm not going to go over. Um, this uh, is going to be fast. Um, yes. Uh, I mean, I think the prior talks are perfect. Um, so uh, two things I want to achieve uh, today, and, and this is obviously not give you like a tutorial on how to start with collaborate product discovery, but try to be as, as pragmatic as possible. Why can I speak on this, right? I might not um, have the same level of experience as the speakers before me. Uh, with some of the things. But what I did is I, I worked with five companies last year on, on, on all sizes, but but mostly small sizes. And before that, I worked with Thomas at, at, at New Work at Xing. And, 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 and then to, to understand this problem that we just talked about, this frustration of, 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 of reading, reading the books, listening to the talks, and so on, and just realizing that everybody is frustrated and nobody's doing it right. Um, I also interviewed, I think by now I'm up to 25 um, PMs and UX people over the last two months in one hour calls, right? And I did really product discovery on their challenges with product discovery. So I went super meta on the whole thing. Um, so what I think you can take away if you're one of the practitioners um, is, is to take away a little bit the pressure on how to get started with product discovery tomorrow. And uh, and if you're a leader, then I would say this is a this is a view into the into a bit of the ground floor of the PMs that I work with, the UX people I work with, what they're struggling with. And uh, maybe that can help you to, to help them, right? Because that's that's your job in the end. Um, concerning the Shuhari, I think this is, fits perfectly in the ha <laughs> element of it. 
um, it's about detaching from from that uh, perfect picture um, and, and and seeing kind of um, that it might not be working perfectly for you. Okay, so with that, let's jump in. I think in stories, I tell stories. Uh, that's why I used uh, sponsored by our favorite generative AI program. You now have a short story here. Uh, this is the agenda of the talk today. Um, and you see uh, Anton. Anton is uh, and his journey in product discovery. It's a five part story. I'll keep it short and brief. Um, Anton is astonished always. Um, he doesn't he doesn't know where to start with product discovery and he's the average PM or UX I talk to. This is not an autobiographical take, um, but there might be some inspirations by reality and, uh, and, and it might relate uh, to yourself or if you're a leader, this might be relatable for your PMs and UX that you work with. Now, uh, why is he why is he like struggling to get started, right? It's, it's, it's really uh, that the two questions don't have answers. They have the questions, they don't have the answers. Where do you want to get to? Anton doesn't know. With product discovery, what are we really trying to achieve? And then the second question is how do we get there? So where do you want to get to? And I think setting that question as a leader, that expectation, and, or setting it to yourself if, you, if you're alone, is learn that we were wrong about one thing. That is what you're trying to get to, to, to learn that you were wrong about something, which is the first counterintuitive point for some people, right? It's, if, you, if you frame it like that, then that makes risk taking easier. It makes, it, it, it makes the whole framing of why discovery is important uh, uh, easier. So just embrace that you're trying to be wrong about something and finding that out, okay? And the second question is how do we get there? And well, then all of a sudden, the, the, the question is not that big anymore, right? It's not about establishing massive product discovery processes. It's about, well, how do we get to know that we're wrong about one thing? And the obvious answer is we conduct one experiment, right? That, that is the obvious answer. But, um, and Thomas has an experiment tracker on this that you can use, it's in the Mirrorverse. Um, but there's a ridiculously, um, like a ridiculously small subset of experiments you can do. And that's the important word, ridiculously. Like you should laugh at the level of experimentation you're doing if you're getting started, right? It should be ridiculous. Um, so that you might be ashamed of it, right? Ship your first experiment and you should be ashamed of it. Otherwise you ship too late. Okay, so now you say, these are not the best practices I've been looking at. This is not the conference talk I've been looking at. They talk about these processes being set up. They use about these, all these different methods, right? Um, that, that could be used for, for discovery. And, and this kind of feels reductionist, right? You, you're too reductionist here. And what I would what I would say is just don't worry about these this avalanche of user centricity that you want to bring over your company now, right? And and it's and and it's just about getting the the ball rolling, right? And the AI here uh, obviously kind of effed up the the generation of it, but you get the point. Um, get a get a ball rolling, and and obviously this is not a new concept, right? Habits is even in the name of continuous discovery habits. Yet I reread the book recently, and I realized that about actually making the first steps, there's not much in there. Like I was actually control effing through the ebook a whole lot <laughs> to try to get a bit more about how to actually get started. So just get this ball rolling and then have faith in nonlinear growth. Now, the people I talk to, um, and this is the fascinating part, and this is why I, I was nodding so hard about what we were talking about before. 63%, and obviously in sample size, blah, this is not statistically significant, okay? mentioned best practices as a reason why they're not doing product discovery currently or not doing it to the extent they would like to, but mostly because they're not doing it, right? So they mentioned best practices as an excuse of why they're not doing it, which is, I'm pretty sure, like with best practices, I mean, I read in the book, it's supposed to be this way. I, re I read that we should um, recruit users this way. I, I said, um, I read that we have to have at least one note taker and one observer in each user interview. So we're not doing them until we have these people. So the books, the, the best practices, the, glory, the glorified like ideal case is holding people back from starting, which is not the intention of the authors themselves, right? But that's the problem we face every day. And I go into companies um, to do hands-on uh, discovery work with them and then trying to establish processes with them that they can stick with. And even that is really, really effing challenging. And I failed over the last year as well in that. And that's why I, I'm so curious to find out what the real problem is. Now, another um, 
uh, and this is of course for the leaders is more relevant um and this the product teams still feel like they don't have buy-in from management to actually do product discovery now if you have the control over this right over communicate that product discovery is part of the role and that you that's okay to take a, take away time for that uh, is is a super powerful way to 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 make sure that people get started but obviously this one is even more critical is that don't i don't know what's the saying like perfection is the enemy of progress or something like that's exactly this right so um lower the bar and just get started so uh this is just a snowball uh and in, like visualization it's basically gain momentum and the team will come so this is also the collaborative aspect right the third reason which i didn't have time to put on a slide is that it's a lone wolf phenomenon i as the pm and the lone wolf driving product discovery i'm as the ux designer i'm the only voice of the customer right as long as that's the talk and maybe you can connect the dots now a bit with what thomas said about maybe that's a self-perception thing right maybe it's not quite as black and white maybe you should collaborate a bit more maybe you should which be open to the fact that maybe you're not the sole voice of the customer don't be a lone wolf in this and do small steps gain momentum and then maybe you know you pull somebody in into the next user interview maybe you ask hey i do you already have user touch points okay let, let's connect these connect these dots and and then and then the momentum will build humans are really really bad at, at, at visualizing and at realizing non-linear growth right that's what we know in investment about compound interest so if you make small progress towards a better user discovery process um this is actually going to multiply on top of each other instead of add so this is going to be bringing you way further than you expected just you have to have faith toolkit this is the toolkit you need i deleted these slides <laughs> because the message is if you are if you're a pm or ux right now you don't need new tools and this is the question that, that thomas was asking before like if i ask you now what do you think the tools are you need right you know you can talk to a user using Zoom, you can record the interview, you can do a Calendly link to do scheduling. Okay, that's the simplest form of getting started. So don't like hide behind data analysis and like maths of things, just start with that, right? So it's about doing it once and then repeating it and then growing on top of it. You, you already know what to do. And that's maybe not the message you wanted to hear, but that's the one I'm, I'm trying to bring to teams. And that's usually what kind of can rattle them a bit. Now. There are legitimate concerns, and this is kind of the last point I want to make before rounding this up. Obviously, it's not easy, right? And obviously, there's um, team buy-in as an issue, and there's uh, there's stakeholder buy-in, and there's management buy-in. And the only slide I have on this, and I think that's the important one, is start with the statement, I am right, you are right. Now, that sounds a little bit self-absorbed, right? But if the goal is to build products that users love, and the goal is to do so without wasting money and effort, then you are looking to do exactly that by introducing better product discovery principles, right? And that is in the org's interest. And make them see that is the very crucial part because there's a communication mismatch here of, of you're trying to achieve what they're trying to achieve. And you have to make them see that, that that is the same thing. And that is the challenging part. Now, last point don't overthink it maturity of your discovery processes will come with time um and this is where i'm bad at <laughs> and thomas will be able to testify on that so don't beat yourself up you might be starting a very small snowball you might uh, not be able to roll the snowball yourself you might need a team for this right and this might take time and, and 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 you might need help also from management and stakeholders and there's one last point. There might be a point where you have to accept the limits of the organization in the current point in time and with the current staffing. And this is what we kind of already discussed. So I'm gonna keep this short. You already know the, the drill here. There are limits between the, there's a delta between the ideal case and what you're currently experiencing. And you have accepting that as the first step to working with it instead of grinding yourself into a burnout, right? That is not worth it. So that's what I uh, have for you today. Um, yeah, you can follow me, whatever. I, I do interim product management and hands-on discovery. And uh, that's it for today. That was nine, 10 minutes and 30 seconds. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Great. Great job. So so just out of curiosity, while uh, questions are lining up, please, uh, please consider your questions, people. Um, I'm just curious, what kind of um, team buy-in have you experienced problems with? I've never seen that myself, actually, from the team. In, in doing product discovery. Yeah, that's fascinating too. I I I realized like for example at 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 Xing where where 
Thomas, and, and I never had this problem. Um, but but I've, I've worked in organizations since where, where there's really a, a lack of understanding that there's, like, I don't think they have read Empowered. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, like where the, where the product trio is still not, the Venn diagram is still yeah. quite separated. And I think that is still more often the case than not. And I realize now as a, as a freelancer and as, a, as somebody going into the company as an external, I'm being pulled in more into companies where that's the case. Because the, peop the companies that don't have that problem, they're not calling for freelancers oftentimes to solve these problems. So, so that would be like a product owner or something would say, hey, you're the designer, just design, just do solutions, mm -hmm. don't do problem space stuff. Yeah, in the last company I was at, actually, for example, it was the opposite, right? It was the designer, like, leave okay. me alone, I just want to do this. I've been doing this for 25 years. Wow. Like, I can do screens really well. Leave me okay. alone, tell me what to do, I will do the screens. Interesting. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. it's still, it still I, exists more than we think, I think, in both directions, right? Because, I mean, the, the stuff that I've been experiencing is more like uh, as an engineer, uh, why would I participate in interviews, right? Or why would I spend right. time watching this, right? And I think that's a hurdle. That is also um, definitely a hurdle. Absolutely, yes. And it's uh -huh. probably the bigger one, right? That's more often the case, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, any questions? But that's good. Well, I want to add something like also when you think so when you think you even speak the same language, you probably don't. For example, uh, if I talk to business people um, um, at my organization, organizations before, we are both talking about opportunities. We're both talking about validation. Um, but like how I would say classic business developers address this topic, completely different. Like, so like I said, okay, I think I see opportunity. And then he agrees like, yeah, that's an opportunity. I will validate it and say, cool, you validate it and let's let's talk. Validation for him means, or for them means, um, desktop research, um, pulling in some numbers of total addressable markets, serviceable markets, um, uh, and competitive landscape. And then based on that, they kind of like validated that there's a business case they can make. Case closed, let's do it. And I'm like, that's not how I see validation. So validation for me means assumption, experiment, validating. I think we also have to think of um, sometimes we might speak the same language, but we don't. So I see this also as a tricky part in, in getting this in the organization. But, but I think at the same point, those are experiments. This research are experiments and there are critical ones, right? They should just yes. not be alone. So they're on the right path. And as I think yes. actually an anti pattern that I've seen sometimes is that teams uh, almost abandon this research and market research and just do their own stuff. They go like a, like a research frenzy and, and you know, want to research every single detail where I think and that was actually a, a question I didn't ask you, Thomas, earlier, but maybe I can just ask it here. Like, there's something about, you know, doing the actual tasks and what and the roles and responsibilities of, of who does and everything, right? But there's also something about uh, strategy and deciding what to spend time on, right? Which is embedded in the strategic direction that the PM represents, right? So, so who has the say in terms of decisions? Like, can I work on this or can I not? Right? Is it is it the PM who is at the end of the table? Because then that's going to be a problem for the designer, or or is it something you decide on as a trio? Right? Like because you would need some sort of strategic sense, some business sense to actually say this is important. This is a desired outcome. This is a, a, a critical assumption. This is not. Or, or what do you think about that? Like who's at the end of the table? Everyone or just one? in terms of decisions, making decisions. Nico, you, you want to say I, something? I, I can answer it too. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I'd say that the, that, that, that exactly, I mean, I, I would say that the, the kind of the collaboration part of like not, not abandoning anything and, and actually keeping that all open is super critical. Like that, that's, that's, I think what resonated with me. Um, and, and, and I think in my experience, the, 
at least recently, um, this, I mean, the, the pragmatism is just what, what is key of, of saying that we can include mm -hmm. everybody, the roles and responsibilities are defined, but then we are able to freestyle on top of them, right? That's just, that's what it boils down to at the end. But there's also something about speed, right? And so speed versus certainty, right? I, I remember uh, at, at the at the Lenus, uh, my my last real job. Uh, you know, I started. I had just been a product discovery coach for two, three years, uh, done master classes. And I was like, I know this setup, and I'm going to make it true, right? So I, you know, embedded the most awesome setup I could think of, right? Small teams of three plus minus uh, one, right? So rely on social interactions, a product trio uh, on, on, on top of that. And, you know, having a customer advisory board to, to have somebody to interview and like uh, weekly touch points, like everything by the book. But what, and you know, that the product trio decides, not just the PM and so forth. But what happened then was that, you know, each role in the trio went Bonanza, like, <laughs> like the uh, it was too free, right? Like the uh, for instance, the designers would just um, research everything and end up in analysis paralysis, uh, and and like just researching everything to death. And the the PM was too afraid to step in and say, no, I I don't need this, right? So we actually had to make some rules and said uh, where we said, okay, so the PM decides what bets we want to make. That some there there's something here that we don't want to research. It's, it, I'm willing to take the chance of that, like as 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 a sponsor. Right. So in that term, there was somebody at the end of the table in terms of deciding what to spend time on. Uh, do you relate to that in, in, in any way? Just any other. I, I mean, for, for me, this is like funny because like in the smaller the company, the less these problems exist, right? So yeah. if you if you work, I mean. You work with three people or four. I mean, this, this is the smallest I've worked with. I work with a team of three. They don't have that problem because the reality of the bank account is always present. The reality of the amounts they, of bets they can take, the amounts of shots mm -hmm. on goal they can take until their budget runs out is always present for all of them. And I find that a curious one because I've now been away from like the 1,500 plus size for a year and a half. <laughs> And to be honest, I kind of love it. Like that, best, that aspect of it, I love because I'm like, wow, this 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 separation from 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 the reality of 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 we are taking bets. These cost time, money, effort. They're the opportunity costs, right? Um, that get, delta gets so high, and it's I mean, it's it's a very hard problem to keep teams aware of that while the company scales and why where the, the the burn rate is not clear and the bank account doesn't get drawn and and the clients don't churn immediately um that is mm. a super super tough challenge um and i can't say that i have answers for that and I, I, that that is a but it's interesting to see that delta from small to big yeah very very good point so there's a, a question from jesper but uh jan do you have uh, you raise your hand do you have comments to that yeah, I think the what Nico just said is pointing for um, for a hack basically um, because I applied this hack already um, and Nico said like in a small team startup not much money not you can hack uh, even if you have a big organization you can put in constraints small uh, smart constraints that kind of simulate this situation so even if you have like and as you said you have a small team but they got bonanzas. By, for example, time boxing is a powerful tool. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, you can say you have just two weeks to do a certain amount of work. Or if you say uh, what I uh, like, a very, very dear friend and uh, product manager is always saying, if I have not had a touch point with my users and learned something within a week, I'm doing something wrong. So or another one is it, it's just a setup of a rule. If I have not spoken to a user in a week, I'm doing something wrong after two weeks he's like oh wait a minute i have to get out of the building kind of thing or another another no, it's really about good. habits right just like you said yeah it's it's you have you have to kind of hack yourself back into the situation where a startup has these external limiting factors and constraints mm -hmm. if you're in a big organization you can set up these constraints on your own and uh yeah, yeah. force yourself to these kind of habits I think this is actually an interesting point that Teresa Torres brought to the game, saying that it's about continuous discovery habits. 
is not just being empowered and just doing the work. It's about doing it on a frequently basis where you have an accumulated effect where it's not you know, just one big chunk. You know, you have the, the value that adds up in between. Uh, and, and, you know, habits as a, as a thing, whether it's rituals or whatever and scrum or whatever, I mean, just habits doing something again and again and again, I think that is a, an undervalued part of, of doing great work. So I think it's just, let's just have Jesper's question. Jesper, you just uh, want to put your camera on and, and just uh, state your question so we all can hear it. Hi guys. Uh, yeah, uh, I was just um, <laughs> I was just thinking about inside an organization. Uh, a lot of people, in in my uh, experience, just go about the day as they used to, despite uh, changes in organization. And that um, I've been in a place for four years where the organizational change each year, uh, and people just roll their eyes and do what they used to do despite the fact that they have uh, essential uh, ideas for the company going forward and all the products. So I was just wondering what kind of thoughts you had on that. Did you hear about this? I see you nodding, probably you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Who hasn't seen this, right? Like, I, I mean, I can start from like the small perspective of, 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 of maybe the less, uh, you know, l the less leadership driven perspective, because that's where I have the, the, the least, the least amount of, of experience, but I think it still helps to have like the ground up view as well. Right. So, um, I mean, I had very, very, very honest conversations with, let's say, for example, a UX designer who was used to just doing the screens, right? Because there was a change coming and it was like, Hey, this doesn't work for us anymore. We need to, this seems basic, right? We need to now have user touch points, user feedback in order to, to be able to validate our ideas, right? We're, we're explaining basics here. And, and the resistance can be so big um, that, that it felt much more, and I'd never worked uh, as a psychotherapist, right? <laughs> but it felt much more like therapy than anything else. Um, and that's a one-to-one -one work, intense, several one-on-one -on -one sessions to like slowly deconstruct what's behind that. Why are you resisting this? Uh, what's scaring you, right? And 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 uh, I have to say, like probably it's not, like in a harsh way, probably sometimes it's not even worth it, right? Like probably you have to get to the point sometimes where you say, I you don't want to work that way. The organization wants to work that way. Either you know. We get together here in a reasonable time frame or it's not working like that can also happen right that's just the perspective i would share on that the resistance change i and think it's also, like it ties yeah. in with your previous point about um working at uh, the large organization versus uh, the smaller companies and smaller teams because smaller teams uh in my view actually quite agile so that they don't think about it, they just do it but when you get in a big organization, you, all the agile thinking starts becoming cumbersome <laughs> in, in a sense. I think there's an interesting point to the larger co corporations where um, uh, if, if the transformation is not rooting in what, like, what do we want to achieve? Um, if you don't have you know, a say in that and you know, if you don't align between the business part or whoever decides on the strategy on a larger scale, and, and, and then the people who are actually doing it, then you end up focusing on how the process and that becomes the safe space. And I think the problem with, with transformations is that then you will have busy work for two, three years where you can just say, you know, uh, let's just, if we just do this transformation, everything will be good. And then you figure out two years later that you know, everything is not good. And you're actually just, uh, you just circle around. Right. Um, and, and I think that comes from just focusing on what, and, you know, making your experiments uh, perfect and doing your hypothesis and your assumptions and doing everything by the book. But if you don't focus on what, like the right strategy, what you want to achieve, not in how you do it, but what you want to achieve, then you've lost the game because that's going to be the driving force of the bets that you take, of the compromises that you make, right? So I think that's that's probably what I see mostly in, 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 in those larger corporations is that the only thing they can focus on is just how. That's the process. That's the only thing they own. And they don't have ownership in, in what we, we set out to do, right? And I think then having that gap uh, is, is, 
is just making you go in, in, in how circles and not what circles. Just my two cents. Absolutely. That's the recipe for cynicism, right? In a sense, because you're, <laughs> yeah. you're I'm trying to do it right, but I'm not, no, I don't know what to do right. So I'm just going to get frustrated at some point. Yeah, exactly. So I think, uh, did you, did, did you get answers to a question, Jasper? Perfect. I did. Yes. Awesome. So we have one last question before we round off. So Jakob, you want to, you want to take the last uh, step? Sure thing, a lot of, lot of pressure going going last, um, but, <laughs> but it, it's it's a bit of a tricky one, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and be concise. So when we were talking earlier about habits, um, I thought that empathizes the value of getting started and doing something like the, the, the small snowball, the simplest thing we can do. I, I, I very much understand where you're coming from with that point. Um, I'm... I'm cautious that it could come at a risk of losing the opportunity if we don't establish the buy-in early enough. If we think we can go so independent and just get started, then everyone else will follow. Do, do we see a risk there of losing buy-in and creating confusion around what's going on? Um, let me let me just quickly explain the, the scenario I've been dealing with literally today just to illustrate where I'm coming from. So I work for a historically sales driven SaaS company where we are taking the existing product into new markets while still also, of course, busy folk, uh, improving the, the core product across markets. So the business development team um, are taking a quite sales led approach in researching new markets, doing the desk research, but also talking to customers in that market. And we are talking about what about product research? Do, do we, because we, we want to research from a different perspective on uncover needs in, in, a, in a different way, of course, from, from a product mindset. Do we get started on that ourselves and bring people onto that journey? Or would that create a feeling that we are either being inefficient by repeating research that has already taken place or a concern that we are trying to start do other people's jobs would it be better to align up front about what we're trying to do or is it a case of learning by doing um i'm not sure what's the right answer here and i'm in the middle of it so i'd be curious to hear your <laughs> thoughts <laughs> does somebody want to take this I, I have some thoughts about jan you want to go no oh, I, I can i can give it a first try um when I look at these kind of decisions, I, I, I immediately, when you were talking about it, something kicked in my head that I have in, in, in my coaching sessions all over the place. And this is, um, there are two, it's, it's, I guess, is it from Jeff Bezos? I don't know. I don't care. I, I don't have records of this. This is these kind of, this. Uh, there are two-way door decisions and one-way door decisions. So there are decisions, for example, when you go into a market, in a new market, there is so much at stake, maybe this is a one way door decision, but most of the decisions in product discovery and in and, and product work are two way door decisions. Just go through it. Look mm -hmm. what's on the other side. If it doesn't, if you don't like it, go back and change and pivot and do something else. So think about what, what you're dealing with right now. Is it a one way door decision going through so much is at stake? Then I'm totally with you. Get as much alignment as you as you want as you need, and mm. there should be no surprises then. But most, if it's just a thing, okay, we can test it. Is the water warm or cold or deep or whatever? And if you don't mm -hmm. like it, turn around and go another way. So, but that's a thing yeah. you can better evaluate than I am. Yeah. I don't know, Nico, add, nice. add to it. Um. I think there's much I can add apart from the fact that I I bumped into exactly that same issue um, where I was trying to basically empower right <laughs> kind of bottom up um, uh, change because that's that's what I've experienced and that's what I realized like I could have done better in the past and 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 I try to help people do now um, and it, it and it ran into a wall. And I talked to uh, Tobias Weidenreich, who's uh, a coach that some of you might know. Um, and, and he works with bigger companies. And he has like a hard rule, I don't think he minds me saying this, where he says he wants mandatory coaching by senior leadership for a prolonged period of time 
before rolling out, let's say, discovery workflows with the teams underneath. Mm -hmm. And if they don't buy the first package, like they're not getting the second. Like he and he has the stance and the like the the the, the you know kind of the senior the senior level perspective where he can just kind of drop these kind of requirements on people. Right. I'm sadly not at that point. Like I can't go to a thousand five hundred person company and just say, "Hey, see people, we're gonna sit down. <laughs> we're gonna sit down for a couple of hours every week." Um, but that's might be what's needed sometimes as well, right? So just. Mm -hmm. Just the experience of running into walls, uh, there's limits. All right. So I, to your question, right, there is risk in over empowering mm -hmm. from the bottom up and then losing the buy and never having the buy and maybe and just just getting stuck. That's, yeah. I would say, you know, the bottom, the bottom up is as important as top down, right? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the it's it, you can create the best thing if, but if you don't have top uh, a top down or or sideways alignment, it's not going to float once you start to launch it. Right? Mm -hmm. You have sales who's going to sell it, you have marketing who's going to market it, right? And if you haven't had them in, involved from the very beginning, you're doomed, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I think I think so. So uh, I, I really hate this thing about bottom up. Of course, you know it's it's a pendulum swinging. Uh, and, and, and I think you should embrace both. And top down is not bad for some things. Mm. Um, and, you know, Jakob, we've experienced that working uh, in, in a company that was very much top down. Mm. I, I really saw the benefits, but I could also see uh, the pitfalls, right? So, so you do need to have both. But I've also worked in, in, the, uh, in the opposite where everything was, was uh, <sighs> good karma and, and stuff. And there's just like a lack of ambition, right? And and uh, things were just, you know, oh yeah, we're live, oh, oh, right? I mean, what if you can rally the whole organization behind it and act in harmony rather than just like offbeat notes here and there? That's so much more powerful, right? Um, so, so I'd rather, I mean, go all, all the way around. Otherwise you're not gonna succeed, at least not the yeah. way you want to. So uh, with that said, then I got the last word. <laughs> so sorry about that, guys. Um, so I just uh, first, I actually just uh, want to say thank you to uh, to our, our our speakers today, uh, Nico and Jan. Thank you so much for stepping in with twenty four hours in 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 advance. I think you you did a an incredibly uh, impressive job uh, of, of just. Uh, just putting on a show that was really good. And uh, thank you everybody for the great questions. I think I, what I really like about these uh, these meetups is, is actually the, the discussion. Um, we could go on for hours. Um, if you would like, uh, oh, 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 of course, uh, Thomas, he needs uh, a bit of praise as well because he was the one who saved the day, uh, who actually said, hey, I have these two guys. I think they would fit pretty good. Uh, but also, you know, for uh, for stirring the debate online and and uh, and being up for this, uh, I know you have your meetup meetup of your own. Um, is it like the, the Munich product and UX, or is it push now? If you want. To uh, yeah, yeah, it's um, it's uh, it was we merged brands, <laughs> so it's yeah, basically yeah, yeah. the push push UX and product meetup. Um, yes, and uh, yeah, we are running this. Sometimes the same like here. Sometimes running in, in Munich. Sometimes um, uh, online, but it has been a bit quiet about the meetup. To be honest, um, fair enough. But but I've, I've, I mean, enough. there's a, a big library on YouTube. You you have some pretty good, uh, awesome, and, and famous uh, guests. You have yes. Jeff Patton on there. I really want to. Yes, Jeff Gotthelf was that, also there. Ask you how you you did that at some point. Uh, but but check Thomas's uh, work out. Um, and uh, I know Nico and, and Jan, uh, you, you have shared your slides and uh, you probably also have, a, a, I know you have a few things you want to send out, like a PDFs uh, if you want to know more and get started. So that will all be sent out uh, after, uh, after this, uh, this session, probably tomorrow morning. Um, if you enjoyed this show, uh, then uh, I would recommend the next uh, remote uh, meetup, which is on April 9th uh with uh with david Pereira, so for somebody uh thomas jen and nico who's got even more linkedin followers than us i think he's got thirty thousand. so um he's I, I guess he's saying something interesting um 
and Peter, a, a Danish HR a product coach, a combination of that, which is, uh, I had some pretty interesting discussions with him. Um, if you uh, like beer and if you like free beer, uh, <laughs> then I think you should uh, join our May 24th uh, physical meetup in Copenhagen. It's on a very popular topic, so I think it's going to be a party. Uh, it's, it's about designing for, for AI, uh, where we have uh, a book author uh, from zero to AI, Gianluca, uh, who lives in, 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 uh, in uh, Copenhagen, and then Arjun flying in from, uh, from uh, the Netherlands to, to join the show. So it's going to be a, a great show, I'm sure. So uh, Nico, Jan, Thomas, you're welcome. Uh, there's free beer on, on Mixed Panel, who's the sponsor. So uh, please come. Um, also, of course, if you would like somebody to lean on, then uh, go sign up at, Mentor, at, at Learning Loop. Um, I can, uh, I can uh, recommend it, of course. Uh, but I think it's, it's actually quite relevant in, in terms of what we've been talking about today. Thank you so much for being here, taking these product discussions to a next level, uh, for, for going beyond the books and, and trying to, to uh, endeavor into uh, discussions about how things actually work. It was a, a really a pleasure uh, having you here. Thank you so much. Have a have a great evening, guys. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks Thank so, so much. Thanks. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye. bye.